So this month, for the month of September, our theme for the month is um, Psalm 51, verse 10. In fact, for the whole duration of September, we have been hearing sermon after sermon about keeping our hearts pure. Yeah? So the theme for this month is Heart of Purity, Spirit of Strength. And we know that comes from the Psalm of David and how David was downcast, he was running. And he has committed a sin. He has killed somebody. Blood was on his hand. And yet, he knew how to turn to the one who would set him free. So that was Psalm 51 verse 10. So this morning, I'll be preaching from another psalm. And it's also psalm of David. Yeah. And today, we are going to look into how to keep your heart pure. It's from Psalm 24, verses 4 to 5. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. Psalm 24, verses 4 to 5. I like this song because it tells us very clearly about the things that we have to do and the things that God will do. The one who has clean hands and pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, in other words, we do not turn to any idols during our calamities, during the time of crisis, when all roads ahead of us seem bleak, we still stay faithful to the Lord. This is our responsibility. And then the next part, verse 5, they will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from God their Savior. So, when we remain faithful in whatever that the Lord has entrusted us to do and has commanded us to do, He will take care of us. So no matter what kind of confusion you are in, no matter how tough the confusion ahead of you is, don't worry. If there are certain areas of your life that the Lord is telling you to let go and you are finding it very hard to let go, trust the Lord that He will take care of it. So sometimes we might be struggling with our flesh to surrender everything to the Lord. Even that as well, the Lord says this thing. You just need to remain faithful, trust Him, Stay on the right narrow path, the straight narrow path, and He will vindicate you. Amen? So if you are in a relationship, say like you are in a toxic relationship, you have someone who constantly reminds you of how worthless you are, you have someone who constantly talks down to you, you have someone who always brings up worse in you. What do you do? Can you still keep your heart pure in this situation? When someone who is the closest to you, your spouse, your father, your mother, your sibling, your best friend who you have shared all the years of struggles, you know, you pour your heart out to that person, the person knows all the secrets, and suddenly the person turns and started to talk negatively towards you. How do you respond? There is a term that I mentioned in the Faith Power Night recently called gaslighting. This is actually a psychological term which is very real. And this is basically an emotional abuse whereby the aggressor manipulates another person 
into adopting his or her perceptions, experiences, or understanding of events. This is a definition from the American Psychological Association. So gaslighting is very real. It happens knowingly and unknowingly. It will only be known by the victim, whereby the victim is always feeling very down, unsure, uncertain of a lot of things. So gaslighting is a very coercive and controlling tactic used by someone to gain more power in a relationship. So someone wants to have a control over the relationship. So someone in a relationship wants to dominate. And instead of using the typical way the person uses just like me. So what does the person do? Constantly giving lies. Constantly giving confusion. Constantly telling seeds of doubts into the victim. So gaslighting is a type of lying where both of you know the truth, but one is convincingly denying it. So the aggressor constantly tells the victim that, no, it's not like that. Are you imagining things? Are you sure that person really said so? Come on, you didn't have a good sleep last night. Go and rest some more. Are you seeing things? Maybe you should see a doctor, you know. These are common terms, common words that will be used because that aggressor is trying to manipulate, gaining control over the relationship. So I'm going to emphasize here that it is lies, a series of lies. And both parties know the truth, but one is constantly trying to say that the lie is the truth. So whenever you are in a gaslighting relationship and you support the person's lie, you are supporting the gaslighting relationship. So the first thing you need to do is to understand that Satan is the father of lies. So instead of going down this route, going to the lies of the gaslighter, you have to make a stand, stand on the truth of God. So this term gaslight comes from a very famous successful play in the 1938 by Patrick Hamilton. It was a British play. And from this play called Gaslight, it spins off into films in Great Britain in 1940, United States in 1944. So what happened in that show? It was about a woman who got married and her husband constantly makes her question her reality. Keep on causing a lot of doubts into her memories. And finally, she starts to doubt her own sanity. Her husband convinces her that she is imagining things when actually it is him all along. For example, in those days, 1930s, yeah, they were using gas lights, yeah, the lights. The lights will just be without being touched. The wife sees that, but the husband says, no, I don't see it really. You are imagining things. But the reality was, the light was really dimmy. But the husband convincingly tells the wife that no, it is not dimmy. The wife hears strange footsteps in the night. The husband says, You are dreaming. You are hallucinating. The pictures in the hall goes missing. And the husband tells the wife, No, it was not there in the first place. Until a series of funny things happening in the new house. And finally, the wife got to realize that she is actually trapped in an abusive relationship 
And this is where the term gaslights come from. And recently, in 2022, you know, there's this uh, show whereby Julia Roberts and uh, Sean, Penn, uh, Sean Penn, yeah, the, uh, the actor in this show, is called Gas Lead. It was about the Watergate scandal, whereby the story of the attorney's wife, Martha Mitchell, her life was ruined because of the gaslight from the Watergate scandal. So this is a real story, you can go and watch it if you want to. Yeah, so this is a TV series premiered in 2022. And then another story that happened, and this is based on a true life story as well, is about a wife who was gaslit by her husband. And this was shown this year. This was a film based on the true story of modern methods, experiences with gaslighting from her husband, and finally, she was sexually abused, violated by the husband as well. And this husband finally was put into jail. So gaslighting is very real and it happens. So we need to identify and we still, as a child of God, we need to keep our hearts pure for God. Because the Lord tells us, as what we have read from the scripture earlier, that the Lord will vindicate us. So we need to do our part. We need to keep our hearts pure. And in crisis like this, in this type of confusion, how do we stay clear? So some of the gaslighting terms that if people love to use would be, can you hear yourself? Then the gaslighter will tell you, you need help, you know, you are not really saying the truth. And then the gaslighter would like to say, it's your own fault. It's all your fault. And then the gaslighter might tell you, don't be so sensitive. You are over sensitive. And then sometimes, you know, they will say that, oh, you are, you are remembering the wrong things. So the gaslighter might say, I was just joking. Don't think it's so serious. And maybe sometimes the gaslighter will say, you are crazy. You are imagining things. You are remembering the wrong things. Why are you so defensive all the time? Gaslighter will also show you that there are certain things that they believe in and there are certain things that they choose not to believe in. So what happened here is that they will tell you always no one will believe what you are saying. So gaslighting is a form of bullying. And then the term that they always like to use is stop feeling sorry for yourself. Don't be a crybaby. Come on, get real, be a man. So, and they love to use false accusation. You say you're going to bring the children back. Why didn't you bring the, child, uh, the children home? But you didn't promise to bring the children home that day. But I guess I will say that you promised that. That was what happened to Morgan Vessel's story. The husband always tells the wife that you said you are going to bring the children home, but you didn't bring the children home today. Thank God I'm here to bring the children home. You are overreacting. And the time that we like to go and say, now you go again. You see, what are you doing now? You go again. You're going down the bush again over this problem. I wouldn't have done that to you. You are imagining things. So gaslighting is a form of abuse. And it can happen subtly in a daily life. And sometimes because it happens so subtly every day, you start to accept it. I want you to know that it is not acceptable because none of you are made to be a rat for someone to travel on. I want you to know that your Savior redeemed you with His blood. You are precious in His sight. So no one needs to be a victim of gaslight relationship. Amen? No one. So you are a victim of gaslighting if you have self-doubt. You constantly doubt your own decision, your judgment, you are confused. You have a low self-esteem. 
You don't care about how you look in public. You have an increased anxiety, especially when your spouse or the guest member calls you. You have anxiety. Your hands tremble before you can pick up the call. You have that. That is a sign that you have a guest need. You have emotional distress. You want to isolate yourself. You don't want to meet your friends anymore. You want to withdraw from the social circle. Constantly feeling manipulated. At home, in your office, it can happen in the office. The boss could be gaslighting you. Your colleagues could be gaslighting you as well. You are the one who constantly have to do all the errands, bringing the coffee in the office. It could have been gaslighted if you didn't know. And the worst thing of all is that you start to feel a loss of personal authority. You start to doubt your own feeling. Why do I feel so bad? Maybe I shouldn't have felt so bad. Why do I cry? I shouldn't have cried. You start to have lost your personal authority over your feeling, your identity, your decision making. You are the aggressor if you have the following signs and symptoms. You constantly deny the reality. You constantly tell someone else that no, it's not like that. Even though other people around you, not just one person, a few people telling you that you have just seen a lie and you kept denying it. When you keep denying it, you are not going to bring yourself out of this shackle. This is a shackle. Yes, lightning is a shackle. And you constantly shape blames. Not my fault. It's my husband's fault. Not my fault. It's my daughter's fault. Not my fault. It's my wife's fault. Because they shape blames. Shame. You're playing a blaming game. Okay? And sometimes you want to withhold information because you want to give half truths. So you want to gain control over the relationship. In the world of public relations, I used to work in the media. I was handling the public relations and also media, media management. We know one thing, and we always say this thing: information is power. Yeah. So yes, Michael knows this thing. So they always say certain information that I feel that you need to know, and that's good enough. I want you to know just that. Other information, I keep it. I withhold it. So the guest actor doesn't tell the whole story, and sometimes even gives contradictory statements. So in the course of conversation, in an interview, you might hear, "Hey, I thought you just said this," and then the person has to say another thing, and it contradicts. So you might be able to spot a guest writer when you listen to the person carefully. And of course, the guest writer likes to use confusion tactics. The whole thing is to muddle you up, mess you up. The purpose is to make you confused so that I can gain control over this relationship. And the aggressor likes to discredit someone else's feelings as well. Oh, this is wrong. You shouldn't have felt that way. I think I have the same burden at home. I'm doing the same load. How can you feel that you are doing more than I did? So you start to discredit someone else's feeling. And it happened constantly. When the person even couldn't feel that I should feel weak, I should feel sad, I should be crying, the person feels that I have no right to feel so. And the other thing about the guest writer is, in a course of conversation, she or he likes to change the topic. Before you can go down to the, to the real issue of the matter, the person starts to change topic. Do you think about my hair today? <laughs> what do you think about my bag? It's not to change topic. And this is a common tactic used by the aggressor or the guest writer. 
because the person doesn't want you to gain control over that conversation. She or he wants to be the one in control. So tell half truths, twist the facts, so seeds of doubt. So the whole purpose is to muddle you and cause you to doubt your own self. So do we see this in the Bible? What do you think? Do you think that we have this in the Bible? Do we have this in the Bible? We have. It starts from the fall itself. The fall. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, who appeared in the garden with Eve? The serpent. The craftiest animal of all that have been created. The serpent was in the garden. And what does that serpent do? The serpent sowed seeds of doubt in the mind of Eve. Did God really say so? Are you sure? No, God didn't say that. This is a form of gaslighting. To cause the woman to doubt about the instructions of God. And then, another classic example that we always see in the Bible is in the life of the patriarch Abraham, Isaac. Isaac was old and he was about to give blessings to his firstborn. And what happened was that Rebecca and Jacob, her beloved son, deceived the father. You can see the story in Genesis 27. And Isaac was tricked into deception, was tricked into believing that Jacob was Esau. How did it happen? First was the voice. Isaac could hear the voice. That wasn't the voice of Esau, that was the voice of Jacob. So Isaac asked, are you really Esau or Jacob? And Jacob said, it is I, Esau. And the next thing was that Isaac asked Jacob to come closer so that he could touch his hands. Sensation. So Isaac was trying to figure out, was, it, was this really my son? And true enough, Rebecca had prepared her son to put furry animal skin onto Jacob's hand and to trick Isaac into believing that this was the hand of Esau. And then the third time, Isaac asked, come, let me kiss you and bless you. That was when Isaac wanted to smell, smell him. Is this really my son, Esau? Of course, we know the story. Jacob, Rebecca had been back on him to put the smell of the wilderness on his neck and his clothes and all. The fat of the animals was on him. So Isaac said, yes, this is my son, Esau. This was guess my thing, brothers and sisters. Rebecca, the mother of Jacob, used gaslighting to trick the father to give the blessing of the first son, the first one, to Jacob, the younger son. So this is a classic example of how gaslighting has already been found in our human nature. And of course we know the beginning of the whole thing was from this Satan. We know that the devil started to put in manipulation, deception, lies, trickeries in us, and it is in the nature of human beings that we will be able, we will be using that very easily. Sometimes without us even knowing as well. But I want you to check and see, does God like this? Is it the Bible? All these stories are in the Bible? So does God approve of all this? No? I want you to turn to your Bible. Let's turn to your Bible, 1 Samuel 15, verses 17 to 26. Now, this is a story whereby 
Saul was instructed. Saul, of course, you know that he was the first king of Israel. He was the person whom God has appointed because Israel wanted a king of their own. So Saul was taller than, was a very handsome man. He was one head taller than all the rest, and he was fit as the king of Israel. So what happened here was that God gave him a very clear instruction in 1 Samuel chapter 50, verse 1. One day Samuel said to Saul, It was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people, Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to stir accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now in verse 3, this is the instruction that God wanted Saul to do. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. And of course, the story proceeded. Saul went on, you know, fought the battle, won, and then what happened? Did Saul fulfill, follow all the instructions of God? Now, in verse 7, then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havila all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king but completely destroyed everyone else. The Senna, he captured Agar, the king, whereas earlier Samuel told Saul specifically destroyed entirely. In verse 9, Saul and his men spared Agar's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats cattle, the fat cows, and the lambs. Every day. In fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or poor quality. So the first king of Israel didn't follow the instruction of God completely. So in verse 17, this is where Samuel came and confronted Saul. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you, king of Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the blunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? So Samuel confronted Saul over his action, which was partial obedience. He didn't obey the Lord fully. He partially obeyed the Lord, picking what he wanted to obey. That is not right in the eyes of God. And in verse 20, that's when Saul gets lit. I did obey the Lord. Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agam, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep to offer as a sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So, Saul twisted the instructions of God. Saul didn't follow the instruction of God completely. And what was the response of Samuel? Let's take a look. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to His voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than the offering 
of all the fats of rats. And Samuel continued, rebellion is as simple as witchcraft, as stubbornness as bad as worshipping idols. And so because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So does God like partial obedience? No. Does God like gaslighting? No. Does God entertain lies? No. No. All those accounts in the family of the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whereby they use this subject and all, those were stories, or rather real stories, for us to follow, to, to emulate, not to emulate, to take as lessons for us not to practice in our life. That's why the Bible is very interesting, because the Bible never hides all the sins of man. Even all the dirtiest things you know, that you can hide in your heart, God exposes them all. God exposes them all. So what should be our response? Because if God doesn't like that light. Let's take a look at the temptation of Jesus. We all know that Jesus was tempted, and we all know that he had fasted for 40 days, and this happened right after he had been baptized in the Holy in the water. He had been baptized in the water, and the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. So you can see the accounts of the temptation of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. At this stage, Jesus was at his weakest physical point, and we all know that Jesus was a full man at that time. So Jesus was a full man just like you and me. He needed to eat as well, lose wine, okay? But then during this time, he had fasted for 40 days, so he's very weak. And at this time, the devil came, and the devil tempted him using all the three common temptations. The first was the lust of the flesh. What did the devil offer to Jesus? You can turn this stone into bread. Yeah. And then of course, the next one, the devil tempted Jesus with the pride of life. At the pinnacle of the temple, the devil told Jesus, jump on, and all the angels will come and surround you, and you will not be hurt, no bones will be broken. That's the pride of life, because you gain glory. You gain glory. Imagine when someone jumps from the top of the building, and the person doesn't die. That's glory, right? That's the pride of life. And then the next temptation that's very common to men, that is the lust of the eye. The devil took Jesus up and showed him, revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil told Jesus, I will give you the glory of this kingdom and all authority over them. So what was the devil trying to do in all these three temptations? The devil was saving Jesus. Jesus was very weak. He had not been eating food for 40 days. He was in the wilderness, desert, hot. He was at his weakest point. And at this time, the devil came to tempt him. So sometimes we might find ourselves in a position whereby we are in the peace of the valley. We are so down. God, I knew with me. Just like what Sister Meeting shared just now, when she was doing Alpha, that was when the devil came to cause a lot of turbulences in her office. Yeah. And she needs to make decisions. But then she stayed steady and she just asked for prayer. And we pray. So the devil will come at the moments that you might not be guarding, and the devil will come and deceive you. Things that you think is all right suddenly became an area of temptation. For example, when I was working as an editor, I had to stay late sometimes because I had to work uh, to rush the deadlines to send the magazine to print. 
So I heard a designer who was a man, yeah, a, a young man designer in the office. So two young people in the office. So initially it was nothing until then I suddenly realized that that's not right, you know. A lady and a man in the office doing the work, they're really doing work, but it's not right. So what I did was that I called my husband. You want to come to my office? And he came to my office. And he came and stayed with me in the office, yeah. And sometimes I'll make sure the other colleagues were around with us as well. So that is basically to save up all of us. He's a married man, I'm a married woman. We have our families to guard. And it's not right, even though we have work to do, it's not right to be found in the office just the two of us. Yeah, because it's after office hours. So you and I are in the areas whereby we can suddenly find ourselves to be in areas of temptation. So what do we have to do? We have to guard ourselves. So this is when Jesus, what did Jesus do? He was tempted, and we want to look into the response of Jesus. When he was in all this confusion, very weak, and so on, how did Jesus respond to all this temptation of the devil? Jesus did not argue. Jesus did not correct the devil. Jesus didn't. What did Jesus do? Jesus just spoke the truth of God. The devil used the word of God. Jesus used the word of God to declare. He just declared the word of God. And what happened after that? The devil fled. The angels ministered to Jesus. So today, brothers and sisters, we want to look into the response of Jesus because that is how we can keep our hearts pure. This is a very good example of how when we are at our weakest point, when we are very confused, being in a gaslit relationship, you want to correct the aggressor. That's a lie. But many a times when you correct the aggressor that leads to the lie, the aggressor will want to even abuse you more. So what do you do? Do like what Jesus did. Just do like what Jesus did. First of all, you need to acknowledge. What do you acknowledge? You acknowledge your situation or your condition. Yes, I am in a gaslit relationship. I'm married to this person. I can't leave this family. I can't leave this marriage. Of course, we are not saying that this is only the way. Yeah? Yeah? We are saying that in all these, you need to acknowledge your frailty and your limitations as well. Because it's only in your weakest moments that you can draw on the strength of God. So, do know what Jesus did? Follow the model of Jesus. He did not argue, he did not correct the aggressor. He didn't correct, he didn't spend a moment to argue with the aggressor, with the devil. So, do like what Jesus did. First is that, acknowledge your situation. Yes, I'm in a gaslit relationship, but I do not need to argue with that person. I want to emphasize here, when you acknowledge your situation, when you acknowledge your condition, you are also accepting your feeling. I want you to realize that the feeling is how you are basically responding towards the situation. And the gaslighter or the aggressor usually wants to cause you to doubt your feeling. That I shouldn't have felt that way, I thought wrongly. But when you acknowledge your situation, you are actually accepting your feeling. And this is a very important part. Because if you are hurt, if you are feeling very tormented, it's not right to have that feeling. So acknowledge it. I am feeling sad right now. Acknowledge that I am feeling tormented right now. Acknowledge that I am feeling as if I'm at the end of the world. I can't see light before me. Acknowledge it. That is your feeling. All right? So don't deny and don't fight it. So second, draw near to God. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you see. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So draw near to your God, your Savior. Your God will be your point of clarity because Jesus he reveals all truths. Jesus is the source of 
all true. So when you are in a relationship that is very toxic, know this one day, you need to draw very close to God. You have to, because He alone can put you into the path of clarity again. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. These are the very words of Jesus Christ, and this is how you are able to really allow the Lord to set you free. So draw as close as possible to the Lord. You don't have to do a lot of things. You just draw to Him and let Him be the one to help clarify the things around you. So the clouds of confusion will leave whenever Jesus steps into the situation. Now the third thing you need to do is you need to declare. You need to declare because there's power in the word of God. There is power confessing God's words over your life, your family, your future. Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us that for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to dividing soul and spirit of joys and marrows and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. So if you are in a relationship that causes you to doubt your own sanity, you need to always feed yourself with the word of God. Because if you do not feed yourself with the word of God, how are you able to bear the word of God? So this is your whole work as a child of God. You really need to read the word of God by yourself. If not, how are you able to bring out the sword of the Spirit? You can't. So follow Jesus. During the time of being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus spoke the word of God. Jesus spoke the truth. So you and I have a homework to do. We need to constantly feed ourselves with the word of God so that whenever we are being put into a situation whereby we doubt our sanity or our own judgment or even the reality around us, speak, declare the word of God over your life. Amen? Amen? Can you do that? Can, right? It's very easy, isn't it? Yeah. Then the formula might be easy. It's even easier. Hand over. How many times have you been talk, uh, talking about hand over? Yeah? So the formula is basically hand over. Now, I want you to understand that when you are handing over a situation or a person or a hurt or a memory, whatever it is that you're handing over to God, you are actually letting go. This is the relationship that you are in because of all the things that are around you, it's causing you to clench your feet. This is not right, this is not right. And you clench your feet even tighter. But when you are handing over to God, you are basically letting go. Slowly opening your finger so that you are able to let go of the control over the situation. If you say that I am always being wounded in this relationship, the person always purposefully turn on the tap on me when I'm sleeping, purposefully bang the door when I'm sleeping, purposefully make sure that I don't have a good peaceful night's sleep. Then what you do is that let go of the control over that particular situation. Instead, when you can't sleep, which is very real, speak in tongues, ask God to help you. I want to share with you this thing. This really happened to me. You know, I, uh, many years ago, we had two little puppies. Now they are, they are gone, they have gone to heaven. Yeah, we had two little puppies, you know, more than 14, 15, 16 years ago now. Two puppies, and I was working as an editor, and I had to go to the office and reach the office by 8.30 in the morning. So I had to wake up by 5.30, 6 a.m. like that. And every time, from 1 o'clock, 2 a.m., 
The dogs will be barking one after another. Oh, 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 oh. I couldn't sleep. I really couldn't sleep. I'll get up. I hold my husband up. So what happened? Why are you crying? Uh, they will be sitting there telling the dog because they are really small parties, feeding them with milk and then making sure that they are eating something and making sure that they sleep. And then we will go back and sleep. Until one day I said, Lord, I'm not having enough sleep. I need to sleep. So I pray to God. I say, God, this is a situation beyond my control. We brought in two parties and I didn't know if they care for them like this. Now I couldn't sleep. And I had to wake up so early. God, can you help me? Close my ears so I can't hear them crying in the night when I'm sleeping. And the Lord really did that. So the next night, when the puppies were crying in the middle of the night, I couldn't hear. My husband would come, you know, took care of the dogs and all. And the next morning he asked me, Did you hear the dogs crying? Oh my goodness, I couldn't hear a thing at all. And that happened throughout the days until the dogs became big grown dogs. Yeah. So I didn't hear them cry in the middle of the night anymore from that moment onwards. So I want you to know, you can even hand over a situation that's beyond your control to the Lord and He will take care of it for you. Amen? So the other thing is that, you know, when I was young, when I was young, I, you know, sleeping in a library at home, you know, swallows and all. So I have a little sister, a young sister. She's the smartest of the lot and she's very sharp. She's very quick as well. So there was one time she accidentally closed the fridge and then the milk poured out and it spilled on the floor. And she was very quick to point to shift the blame towards me. So that it was me who, poured, who, who closed the fridge so loudly until the milk spilled on the floor. So it was me. So she shifted the blame onto me and I knew that it was not right. So I started to fight. And then I remember very clearly my father and my mother came into the situation trying to solve the issue. And then my mom pulled me aside. My mom told me, don't quarrel anymore. Keep quiet. And I said, why? I didn't do anything wrong. You know, she was the one who closed the door. Oh, oh, oh. I went on to say a lot of things. Yeah? Then my mom said, keep quiet. Can you not hear your father trying to correct your sister? Your father is trying to make sure that she owns up to her mistake. We know that it's not you, but you don't have to defend yourself. Trust your father that your father will handle it. I was very angry, I was very, very angry. But when my mom said my father would handle it, right? My father would take care of it, right? Then I looked, I saw my father really questioning my sister until the point that she said, Yeah, I can't say no. Then I only realized that my father can take care of that. I have actually, when my mom talked to me, I have actually kept quiet and handed over the situation to my father. That is how we hand over. Amen. When you are very angry, when you are very agitated, when you know that it's not me who has made the mistake here, it was the aggressor, the abuser. But don't fall into the trap that he wants you to fall into. Hand over to the Lord. Draw the boundaries, okay? Draw the boundaries. You draw the boundaries physically. You draw the boundaries spiritually as well. Because when you hand over to the Lord, you are basically telling that, God, I can't handle this thing. This is the boundary and the person has crossed the line. Now, God, I can hand over my control of this situation to you. So, God steps in and God takes over this situation for you. Amen? For you. Because you are precious in His sight. He has come to die for you and you belong to Him. And He will really take care of you. So, give it to Jesus and let God be God. Amen? Now, the fifth one is to trust God. Your job is to stand firmly on the promises of God. That's why you need to read the Word of God by yourself. You need to continuously feed yourself with the Word of life, with the Word of truth. Let the truth of God set you free. Don't let the words of men and women that offers you comfort to set you free. No, it's only the words of God that can set you free. Trust your good shepherd. And you need to do self-care because the self-care here is make sure you don't hold grudges. You don't bear bitterness. Don't keep unforgiveness. Stay faithful in your commitments and your responsibilities because the Lord says 
vengeance is his. Romans 12, 19. Dear friends, never take revenge. Never take revenge. Link that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, say the Lord. You and I are mere mortal. We don't need to take revenge like this. You can't carry, you can't keep scores. You can't really keep scores. You can't. The more you keep scores, the heavier your shoulders will be. Stop keeping scores. Instead of keeping scores, let God be God. Let Him be the one who is going to vindicate you because He says He will pay them back. So your job is basically to make sure that whatever that you are doing is right by God. So Psalm 139 verses 23 to 24 Search me God Search me God and know my heart Test me and know my anxious thoughts See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verses 23 to Your job is to walk faithfully, following the instructions of God. That is your job. Whatever the aggressor does to you, the aggressor will have to meet his or her savior one day. The aggressor has to settle his accounts with God. Don't bring the problem of the aggressor onto your shoulders. It's not for you to carry. Even though that person might be the one that you love the most, your spouse, your father, your mother, your sibling, your best friend, whoever, it doesn't matter. That is the burden of the aggressor, not yours to carry. So your job is to make sure that you stay right with God. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen? And once again, Psalm 24, verses 4 to 5. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. You know, when you want to vindicate yourself, your palm is only this big. When God vindicates for you, God's hand is out of us. You can't even see how big is his hand. So trust, trust, trust your God that he will really vindicate you and he will really take care of you. Now, sometimes we say that you know, it's very hard and it's very impossible. But I want to tell you a story of a lady in the Bible. This is her legacy. Queen Abijah. She's a woman who had an evil husband and a godly son. She was a wife of King Ahaz. King Ahaz was known as the evil king of Judah. He even burnt his son as sacrifice to the pagan worship. That's how evil he was. Yeah. So Abijah. The name meant my father is the Lord. And she was a daughter of Zechariah, who was a priest, high priest. And it means, Zechariah's name means God remembers. And Abijah, she had a son. Her son was named Hezekiah, God strengthens. So the story of Ahaz, Abijah, Hezekiah, is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 to 29. You can go and look into it by yourself. But what I want to point out here is that 
Abijah was living daily with a husband who was known to be evil, who even killed his own children as to offer as a burnt offering. And yet, Abijah was able to raise a godly son. She didn't allow the toxic relationship with her husband to affect her to raise up a son who will follow the ways of the Lord. I want to tell you that even if you are in a situation where you feel that I have no more future, you have a call of life. What is that call of life? Focus on that call and trust God in that. But Abijah, she focused on this son of hers. And she focused on just this one son. And she raised him up in the way of the Lord. And this son was known as the king who obeyed and feared the Lord. And this was King Hezekiah who brought Judah back in the right worship of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. The Lord engraved the name of Abijah in the Bible for all of us to see and remember that even in a toxic relationship, you can, you are able to raise a godly son. Amen? You can. So follow the model of Jesus. First, acknowledge your situation, your frailty, your limitations, your feeling. Acknowledge that. Second, draw near to God. Draw near to God. That is your only source of clarity. That is the only thing. Jesus is the only one who can clear you from all these clouds of confusion. No matter how many years you have been trapped in this shackle of lies, only Jesus can set you free from that. So draw near to God. Draw near to Him and then declare. Declare His word over your life, your family, your future. Declare. And when you hand over the situation to the Lord, you are also drawing boundaries. You need to draw boundaries with the abuser. You need to. Because if you do not draw boundaries, you can't keep your heart pure. Because everything that a person is doing will affect you. You need to draw a line. Draw a line. So draw a line by handing it over to the Lord. God is something I can't control. The person is attacking me again. He's spreading lies again. Draw a boundary. Hand it over to the Lord. Hand it over to the Lord. Draw it physically. Draw it spiritually. And fifth, trust the Lord. Trust God, amen? Because the Lord knows the desires of your heart and the Lord himself will put you as the head of the house. Yeah, he's going to put you as the head and not the tail. And he has redeemed you with his blood. So you are indeed precious in his sight. So trust him. In his time, he will make all things right. He will definitely vindicate you. Amen?